Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. So I want to talk to you uh, tonight, part two of last week. Just said I needed a couple of weeks. I want to wrestle with the principle and talk to you about dreams, influence, and inspiration. <clears throat> and tonight, I want to talk to you about the sweet spot of why. Um, and so, uh, I've got a little um, slide of, of that I want to show you of a, a target. That's just like an archery target with the three circles that are on the archery target. Uh, with three words on there, why, how, and what. And I want to talk a little bit about, about that um, tonight. Now, just, just by way of, <coughs> of um, revisiting last week, just to give a little bit of a foundation, um, I received a letter a few years ago which um, contained, which to me was a very moving message, and uh, inside the envelope was a box of Rizzler cigarette papers and uh, a part-use package of, um, of tobacco. And uh, this letter said something about the person's <coughs> life, but uh, the thing that humbled me the most uh, was two things. Number one, it was, a, it was a marker of change in that person's life. Um, but what really humbled me was, was these few words in the letter, thank you for being an inspiration. <coughs> Which caused me to, to ask myself the question, what, what really does that mean? And, and what is its significance being an inspiration? It evidently had produced a new belief and behavioral change. The question is, how did it do that? So, in pursuing answers to these questions, we considered some things. And in considering those things, uh, we moved into a video. Now, one of the things I mentioned, first of all, <coughs> was that the problem with age is that somewhere in the process of life, something or someone woke us up and uh, woke us up from our dream and uh, at that point those of you who've got a few years on your back may, may, may connect with this reality and pragmatism started to take over where passion and purpose once made us blind to certainty and impossibility certainty and impossibility were not things that I ever considered at one time uh, they were just things to be overcome where where in, 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 in waking up from a dream, reality and pragmatism <coughs> takes the passion and purpose that, that made us once blind. And the problem with the death of a dream is that inspiration dies with it. And uh, I'm very aware of that, very aware of that in my own life uh, and journey, that if the dream dies, inspiration dies with it. So you need to have a dream still. If you want to be an inspiration, you want to be inspired, you've still, got to have a, you've still got to have a dream. So at the other end of, of this spectrum, we talked about those who were born 1994 or later, who are technically described as a group of people known as millenniums or millennials. And um, uh, we showed a video addressing this issue of the millennials. So two ends of the spectrum, we've got the, the one end where where somebody woke us up from the dream, and now we have one perspective of life. And then, and then at the other end is, is the perspective of the millennials. Now, I don't want to show you the whole uh, video again, but I just want to show you the first three minutes just to give us a reference point going back, and then we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk a little bit from there. Um, what's the millennial question? Apparently, millennials as a generation, which is a group of people who were born approximately uh, 1984 and after, um, uh, are tough to manage. And they're accused of being entitled and narcissistic and self-interested, unfocused, lazy. <laughs> but entitled is the big one. And, uh, and because they confound leadership so much, 
what's happening is leaders are asking the millennials, what do you want? And millennials are saying, we want to work in a place with purpose, love that. Um, we want to make an impact, you know, whatever that means. Um, uh, we want free food and bean bags. Uh, and so somebody articulates some sort of purpose, there's lots of free food and there's bean bags, and yet for some reason they are still not happy. And that's because um, you, the, they're missing, there's, there's, a, there's a missing piece. Um, what I've learned is that there, I can break it down into four pieces, right? There are four, four things, four characteristics. One is parenting, the other one is uh, technology, the third is impatience, and the fourth is environment. The generation that we call the millennials, too many of them grew up um, subject to, not my words, failed parenting strategies, you know? Where, for example, they were told that they were special all the time. They were told that they could have anything they want in life just because they want it, right? They were told, um, uh, some of them got into um, honors classes not because they deserved it, but because their parents complained. And some of them got A's not because they earned them, but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. Some kids got participation medals. They got a medal for coming in last, right? Which the science we know is pretty clear, which is it devalues the medal and the reward for those who actually work hard. And it actually makes the person who comes in last feel embarrassed because they know they didn't deserve it, so it actually makes them feel worse, right? So you take this group of people, and they graduate school, and they get a job, and they're thrust into, an, into the real world, and in an instant, they find out they're not special, their moms can't get them a promotion, um, that you get nothing for coming in last, and by the way, you can't just have it because you want it, right? And in an instant, their entire self-image is shattered. And so you have an entire generation that's growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations. The other problem, to compound it, is we're growing up in a Facebook, Instagram world. In other words, we're good at putting filters on things. We're good at showing people that life is amazing even though I'm depressed, right? And so everybody sounds tough, and everybody sounds like they got it all figured out. And the reality is there's very little toughness, and most people don't have it figured out. And so when the more senior people say, well, what should we do? They sound like, this is what you got it in. And they have no clue, right? <laughs> That's the summary. Any of you that didn't see it last week, you can, uh, you can see that online. So some distinguishing factors that, uh, that came up in this. Um, that we're living in a world where friends are contacts on Facebook. And uh, filters are a click away on a computer, tablet, or mobile phone to block out anything we don't want to hear. I notice some of you have got a few years on your back. This is like alien language, but, but quite a few of you, this is the reality of your life, that you live life with filters, and you somehow think because you filter out the sound, you filter out the issue. But you don't filter out the issue just because you filter out the sound. Before we ever had technology and filters, we used to go, la, 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 la. I'm not listening. But how many of you know that doesn't change the situation? It doesn't change the issues that you have to face. But we have simpler ways now uh, in our world to, to block those things out and, and to filter. I think the word filter is a wonderful thing. We filter stuff out that we don't want to face, thinking if we filter it out on social media, somehow we filtered that problem out of our lives. And so, of course, there's the other one that really bugs me, um, because I'm a thinker and an investigator. Students creating safe places in our universities, safe places, in the debating room, so that no one feels uncomfortable over anything which is done or said. <clears throat> That's just ridiculous. Life is going to make you uncomfortable. People are going to say things that you don't like. Get over it. Get used to it. Find mechanisms that allow you not only to cope, but to overcome in life, okay? Jesus came, didn't help us to cope. And I hate doctrine of gospels that make us copers rather than overcomers, okay? That's not the pathway of creation to a better or safer world. It's an avoidance of the issue that we all have to wrestle with in the quest for love, fulfillment, joy, 
love of life, peace, confidence, deep meaningful relationships, friendships, and faith that endures. And incidentally, uh, it was mentioned on the video, there are no participation medals given for life, okay? You win or you lose. Okay? No participation medals. Oh, well done, you took part. You win or you lose. I want to help you win. Yeah. Right? I want to help you win. The Apostle Paul one day said to a culture that were familiar with what would develop into our understanding as the Olympic Games, if you're going to run the race, run as though to win. Don't just participate in the race. Run as though to be a winner. So this is just my summary of last week. <coughs> Because if we, if we don't address this, the problem is we see life through a lens that only allows us to wrestle at a superficial level with what we do and how it's done, or what is done and how it affects me, not why do we do it and why is it done. So we ran on to another thing on August 28th, 1963. 250,000 people turned up in Washington, D.C. for what would become the tipping point in the civil rights movement of America. And they heard Dr. Martin Luther King say this, just a clip from, from what we saw last week. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creeds. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day... So, his famous speech, <clears throat> I have a dream. Uh, that speech ignited something in people. Uh, I know it did because we're still watching it now in 2016, and people like Jenny Flintoff are still using it in their, in their motivational talks to, to management and industry leaders. We, we, we know that, that that speech ignited something in people. The truth is, at that time, there were other figures in the civil rights movement who were equally good orators as Dr. Martin Luther King. <coughs> but... It was this moment and this speech that everybody remembers. My question is why? Among all the things that were said and all the people that said it, why was it this speech and this moment that we remember? My conclusion on that is that on hearing this speech, people felt inspired. There's something very powerful about inspiration. It's inspiration that makes the difference between ordinary and special. It's inspiration that makes the difference between listening and actioning. It's inspiration that, that, that causes people to follow you, not because they have to, but because they want to. How many of you know, when you're in authority, the only reason people are following you is because they have to. Sorry to burst the bubble. Any of you managers in here, company leaders, people follow you and do what you say because they have to. But inspiration causes people to do things because they want to. It causes them to listen because they want to. I told you last week my greatest desire because somewhere along the line I have to I have to acknowledge that things happened in my life that woke me up from the dream, and in being woken from the dream, I have struggled to find the inspiration that is necessary, because the inspiration comes from the dream. So I'm preaching to myself again that the point is, we have to come back to the place of where we are inspired. So the question then is, what was it that inspired them? Well, let me tell you what it wasn't. It was not a 12-point plan on what the problem was and how to fix it. That's what it wasn't. 
And the truth is, 12-point plans on what the problem is and how to fix it, if they are delivered in a situation where you have to submit to authority, you will do them, but you'll only do them because you have to, and they actually won't fix the problem. Martin Luther King did not say, I have a plan. He said, I have a dream. There is a difference between I have a plan and I have a dream. Here's the difference. One tells you what to do. The other one tells you why you're doing it. And I propose to you that when you know why you're doing something, you'll do what you need to do anyway because you know why you're doing it. Inspiration doesn't inspire us what to do. Inspiration inspires us why we need to do it or why we need to become it or why we need to believe it. He didn't exert his influence by saying, I have a plan. He exerted it by declaring, I have a dream. Now, there is a reason that I have a dream is more powerful than I have a plan. And the reason is this, because you were made to live life from the inside out. And that's why when a dream catches us, it's so powerful because you were actually designed, and I can show you that biologically, your biological makeup reflects that God-created thing in you. You were designed, you were made to live life from the inside out, not from the outside in. And when you live life from the inside out, the issue is it, it resonates with the deepest part of your being. It is something that's unexplainable but, but very tangible. You can't put it in a bucket, you, you can't bottle it up, but, but, but somehow it's, it's very tangible because when you learn to live life from the inside out, it resonates the deepest part of your being. Now here's a bit of the God bit. Finding, finding Jesus is not like finding Nemo. For those of you who have a clue what I'm talking about. In finding Nemo, it's that you reunite, you re, you reunite with the Father. Sorry, I don't know what I've written here. Okay, so with Nemo, it's about, we're finding Nemo so that we can, we can bring him home to find, to his father. But, but the thing is, when it's with us, we are reunited with the father of Jesus. In Jesus, we're reunited with the father of Jesus. So we're not finding Nemo, we're finding the father of Jesus. We're finding the father. And that's what happens when we live life from the inside out. We begin to find the father. Now, dreams don't communicate what we are going to do or how we're going to do it. They communicate why we are going to do it and why it must be done. See, there's lots of things that, as a house, we have to understand are being driven by a dream. We, 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 why do we give £18,000 a year to Gianni Gaeta and life churches in Austria when Austria is a prosperous Western European nation with churches being opened and built in the Life Churches Network, why do we do it? Because at this moment, they are not providing that 18,000 that we give. And the argument could be, well, why should we give it? Because they're prosperous. But you see, why we give it is because we don't want the progress of Life Church to stop. We don't want the church planting to stop. We're not saying, well, Austria should have enough money. We're saying there are people who need to be reached. And if Austria won't give the 18,000 pounds that is necessary to fill that that hole, we will. Where do we do it? Why? Because we care, because we believe 
in what they're doing? Why have we poured a bunch of finance over the last 18 months to two years into a place called Bukavu in the Congo, which is in the backwoods of nowhere, because the lady called Jill Shields had a dream because her father helped create a Bible school in Bukavu that was serving the nations until the rebellion started and the civil war started and it got ramshackled and broken down and the denomination started stealing the money, sad, stealing the money that was supposed to go to ministering to the people. But for her dream was that she would rebuild what her father had built that had been destroyed and why did we give money into it? Because we care about those people from Rwanda and Congo and the places around there who are not going to be touched unless somebody rebuilds that Bible school and sends architects out and fixes it. Why do we do it? Because we believe in it. Why are we doing it? Because we have just lots of money that we can throw. No, we haven't. Why do we have a staff that is way, way too big, technically for a church of our size? I'll tell you why. Because we actually care about the kids that are on the street. We care about the kids in our community. We care about the fact that there is not provision for them and somebody needs to care for them and help them and bless them and show them unconditional love and life skills that they have never had. We care about that. So to do that, we have to put somebody in. We care about the kids who come in on Saturday morning to Danny's life zone. We care about the schools that he ministers to. We care about those people. Why do we do it? Because we care. Because we have a purpose. It's a why. That's why we do it. Why do we run Dance Academy? Because it's touched more people's lives than anything else that we have ever done in this church. Why are there some things that some of you think we should deal with, but we don't deal with them. I'll tell you why, because the love of God has touched my life and Chris's life in such a way that we cannot stand in judgment on the lives of others and start imposing rules and regulations and laws when God in his grace brought kindness and forgiveness and restoration to us. There is a why. See, it's the why. But some of you say, what are we doing about that? How are we going to deal with that? I say why we're not dealing with it, but why we are dealing with it through not dealing with it, because it's the ministry of grace, it's the ministry of kindness, it's the ministry of spirit going into people's lives. So many of these issues, now I don't know how long we can continue. If we don't have some kind of a miracle, we're going to be struggling to continue to provide all that we are providing. But we are believing God because we haven't selected it because we have a plan. We're doing what we're doing because we have a dream. And we're believing what's driving it is not what we ought to do or how we ought to do it. Because I'll tell you right now, if we go by what and how, most stuff this year is going to get cut back drastically and is not going to happen. But if we have a why... We have to believe and trust God that in the why, in the dream, inspiration will draw us all together to say we cannot allow this to fall. I believe is the language of the why and of the dream. I believe. For some of you, that would be a good place for you to come to. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the way to the Father. I believe that we can have a relationship with the Father that fulfills the deepest longing of our heart. I believe. I believe that you and I can make a difference. It's the language of the why and of the dream. The problem is that we tend to live life at a superficial level. Even though everything deep down inside is screaming for greater meaning, we live life at a superficial level. We look to satisfy that craving from deep down at an equally superficial level, which is the level of more. If I have more money, if I have more friends, if I have more marriages, if I have more sex, if I eat more food, if I'm more famous, that somehow that's going to solve it. But like Sinek said, when you give the beanbags and the free food, his question was, why are you still not happy? 
We gave you free, we gave you beanbags and free food. Because we try to meet super, at a superficial level, we try, to, we try to meet those needs. And this is because cultural pressure teaches us to live life from the outside in, not the inside out. We think that if we gather enough data, if we analyze the features and benefits, if we have all the facts and figures, we can change things, never get depressed and be happy ever after. Let me tell you something. We live in a world where we have more information, more data, more opportunities, more features, more benefits, more facts, more figures than we have ever had, but more people are depressed, more people are mentally ill, more people are committing suicide. Why? Because that's not the solution. But you see, when, when you begin living life from the outside in and start with what, that becomes a, 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 an analysis of the situation in a hope that somehow you resolve the problem. What we do and how we do things are important. Please don't get me wrong, what we do and how we do things are important, but not nearly so important as the why. Do you know the most important thing in the context of the Father sending Jesus is not what the Father sent Jesus to do. It's why he sent Jesus to do it. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's the most familiar verse in evangelical Christianity. God so loved the world that he gave. Why God did what he did is actually much more important than what God did itself. Even though the what and the how are important, the why are more important to God. God so loved that he, he gave. So, so let, me, let me give you a little biological background to this and then we'll, we'll tie it up. Before there ever was a neurologist or a neuropsychologist, here's what the Bible says. Matthew 12, verse 34. We'll forget brood of vipers, okay? Just go to the end of that. For out of the abundance of the what? Out of the abundance of what? The heart, the mouth speaks, okay? Let me give you another one. Mark 7, verse 21. For from where? Where? Out of what? Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, or in other words, what he is pointing at is the most critical part of our life is the inside out. And if you don't get the inside right then you're not going to fix the problem. So let me talk about a little bit of biology. The brain is made up of three major components. Now this is very much a layman's, you know, if any of you have a degree in medicine and a brain surgeons, forgive me, this is very, very superficial. Your brain is made up of three major components. The, the first one, the outer one, the outer portion is the neocortex. And the neocortex is what governs rational, analytical thought and also language. So, so the outside bit, rational, analytical thought and language. But it doesn't control how we feel or drive behavior. The possession of information and knowledge doesn't make us feel better. It doesn't. And yet the first part of your brain, the part that wants to get involved straight away, is the outside bit, just like the what on our thing. It's the outside bit that wants to rationally and analytically think. And it also controls language, which is interesting. Now. Within that, there is the limbic portion of the brain, which really, there are two bits to the limbic portion. Limbic one, as we're going deeper into the brain, is responsible for all our feelings. And it's separate to the neocortex, but responsible for all our feelings. Now, that includes feelings like trust 
and loyalty. Now, it's very evident to me that the pressure of life pushes us to live in the outer cortex because we just rationalize and analyze everything, which leads us to, I'm too tired, I can't, it's too difficult, maybe I won't, there's not enough going for me. And so things like trust and loyalty don't happen because we are not allowing at the innermost part of our being to reflect values. There are no values in the neocortex. Rational says, I want to have sex with somebody. I'll find somebody, or whoever it is, if I can get away with it, I'm doing it. Rational, see? There are no value system when we live life from the outside in, no value system. It doesn't belong to me, but I can put my hands on it, and if I can take it, I'll have it, nobody will know. No value system. So when we live life from the outside in, we live without principle. We live without a sense of, of commitment and loyalty and trust and all those things that we need to feel. When you go to the next level, the deeper one, limbic two, uh, that's my words, limbic two. You're not going to find that in the medical manual. It's just I had to describe it somehow. Limbic is right, but one and two is my... Limbic two, the deepest part of the brain is responsible for all human behavior all decision-making roots from here. So your decisions are either going to be the result of living life from the outside in, rational, analytical, ultimately affecting what you decide to do, how you behave, or you will live life from the inside out in which there is a behavior at the core of you that manifests itself out and changes how you analyze things, changes how you see the world rather than how you see the world affecting what you believe and how you behave. The limbic parts of the brain, incidentally, have no capacity for language. They represent something deeper than language. Isn't that fascinating? Because when you get to the heart of a person, something deeper than language is represented. How many times have you ever said, I just can't put into words what I'm feeling right now? Why is that? Because now your limbic brain, your inner person is responding and, and, and you think I'm just not very good with words. No, your mind that is now speaking to you is not very good with words because language doesn't come from there and it's trying to express itself by saying what it feels. So it's coming right from the inner core of decision making through feelings and it says things like... I, I, I don't know what I'm feeling right now. I, I, I don't know how to express what it is that I feel. I, I, or another thing we use, I can't, put the, I can't put it into words, but when that's happening to you, it's because you are touching that inner resource that's responsible for behavior and feelings that doesn't have language as part of its being. But... but but how many of you said, I, I, I just, I made the decision, I just had a feeling. Very powerful. Bible talks about spirit. All this is why a person can be a mine of information, a mathematical genius, and have analyzed all the available information, yet be totally full of BS, talk total twaddle, and complete nonsense. Because that informational thing is not what governs how we live life successfully. It's the why part of the brain that we're looking for. Also, it's why when we live from the inside out, we still use phrases like, just doesn't feel right, I just believe, I just know it's true, those kind of things are coming. It's the why part of the brain that controls behavior. Why changes you? Why am I feeling this? Why is it important to believe that? Why should I have values? Why should I have to make choices? Those are the arenas in our lives that 
control our behavior. Why actually changes you? And when we live life from the outside in, listen to this, very important, the why becomes the explanation for life rather than the reason for living life. Let me illustrate. Well, when I see what's happening to me and how life is working out, I just ask the question, why me? And then, of course, our answer becomes, because I have no value. There's the why. I'm not worth anything. I'm just useless. I'm a failure. Nobody loves me. Nobody really cares about me. Why would anybody want to help me? So the why becomes an explanation for the problems of the what and the how. Look at what's happened. Look how it's happened to me. And then it becomes, some, well, why should anybody love me? Why should anybody give to me? Why should anybody help me? Why should I be considered worth anything? And so when we live it the wrong way around, the why becomes, becomes for us an explanation for life. Well, it's no wonder this is happening to me. Why it's happening to me because I'm worth nothing, etc., etc., etc when it's supposed to be the reason for living. The way we rationalize what is happening to us and how the world and people are treating us if we're living life from the outside in will govern the whys of our life. Why am I unlovable? Why can I never be a success? Why will I always be poor? Why will I always be alone? They begin to be the things then that we believe. But when we live from the inside out, why becomes the driving force determining how we read what is happening to us and how we see ourselves and others and how we behave in ourselves and how we behave towards others. Because we start with the, why we, because I have value. Why? Because God loves me. Why? Because there is purpose in my life. Why? Because people need loving. Why? Because there is a need and I can meet it. And then we start to think, so how can I do that? And what must I do to make that happen? But we're now being driven by the why. And do you know what happens? The, the heart, the spirit begins to explode. It begins to live again. The inside begins to live. When actually what's happening at the moment to most is the why is being crushed because life can only be lived by the outside. So if you think of this as a target, your target is not what is happening or how is it happening or what should we do and how should we do it. The target that you have to hit, the sweet spot of the aim of life is to put your life into the why circle, living life from the inside out, understanding there is a why to your life. You have a why. You are not a meaningless being floating through the universe just waiting to die on push-up daisies. There is a why to your life. God put a why on your life. God so loved the world. He's saying that's why God did what he did, because he loves you. That's why... Not because sin is sin and hell is hell and judgment is judgment. No. Why? Because God so loved the world. There is a why to your life. And when you connect with that why and connect to the fact that the why of my life is that I am loved. Why am I loved? Because he chose to love me. Why does he care about me? Because he created me. And you begin to live from there. It changes the way you behave and how you behave towards others and the whole of life. So why makes you live life with purpose? It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Why makes you live life with purpose? That's where I've started asking again, not what do we need to do as a church and how do we do it, but why do we need to do this? Why do we need to care? The question is not for me, what do you do on Saturday evenings? The question is, why do you do what you do on Saturday evenings? That's why I'm here all the time. You said, no, you're here all the time because you're employed and you're the preacher. No. Because all the years that I wasn't, I was still here not because it was what I did, but because of why I did it. 
Because that inner part of me, that part that comes alive when it's touched and you live life from the inside, I wanted that to connect because God has a why, he has a reason and there is a reason for my life and there is a reason for your life and when we feed the why, we live life from the inside out and not the outside in. So four things, why makes you live life with purpose? Why produces dreams? And because of that, why produces inspiration? That thing that we're looking for. And why is the bullseye where new belief and new behavior begin? Find the why. Find the why that is not your explanation for life, but your reason for living life. Let me say that again. Find the why that is not your explanation of life. Well, I know why that's happening to me. But find the why that's your reason for living life. I am someone with a purpose who God loves so much that he made a way for me to be found and restored in relationship with the Father so that life could be lived from the inside out, what the Bible calls spirit, lived from the Inside out. So we used to have an old song. I'm going to finish with this. We said this, why should I feel discouraged? There's a good why. Why should the shadows come? See, it's a little different to why don't I have any money? Why am I still single? Why aren't I happy? Why aren't I being promoted? See, all of those are living from the outside in. They're all analysis. But, but when you're changing, it's, why should I feel discouraged? Why, why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? In other words, why should I live always wanting to get out of here more than I want to stay here? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Here's what Jesus said. What man, by worrying, can add an inch to his height? What lily in the field can blossom by worrying? What bird can worry its way to its next meal. But you see, when we live life from the outside in, life starts with worry and not with why. But when we live life from the inside out, life starts with why. Why should I worry? His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. There is a way to live from the center, from the core, which is the way of the why. And when you live the way of the why, life truly starts. And then the how and the what simply become servants of the why, rather than the what and the how crushing the why of your life. I want the why to come alive, because in the why is the inspiration, in the why is the dream, and in the why is the purpose. Let's just pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we drop these words tonight, I pray that they will be like seeds in good soil to produce and grow and develop and express themselves and produce a harvest in people's lives. That what we look on from these words will be transforming in our lives. Help us, Father, to live from the inside out. We, we repent. We, we, we're sorry we turn around realizing that in so many issues of life we live from the outside in what's happening to me, how did that occur? When, when you're calling us, you're calling us by your grace to live at the center, to hit the center of the target, to live in the why. There is a why to my life. There is a why to my life. I'm not an accident. There is a why to my life. And that from that place, things flow that words cannot explain because words don't live in that place. And I want for every person in the sound of my voice tonight, Father, every person 
who listen to this online to experience things that they cannot explain because it's coming from the place of why, from the place of dream, from the place of inspiration. Help us all to understand that the strength to live out the how and the why is present in us. Uh, the strength to live out the how and the what is present in us when we receive the inspiration that comes in the place of the why. So let this drop on our lives, Father, and, and touch us and help us and, and bring us through to a new place where we are overcomers, not victims, but overcomers, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.